Hi everyone, welcome. Today we're going to learn about a powerful theory of quantum gravity known as holographic duality. Why is this theory interesting? Perhaps you've heard that the problem of unifying quantum physics with Einstein's theory of general relativity, the problem of quantum gravity, may require us to substantially modify one or both of these theories. That could be true in our world, we don't know yet, but we do know that it isn't necessarily true. Today we're going to learn about a theory of quantum gravity in which quantum and gravitational phenomena do more than just peacefully coexist, they actually richly interlink. This theory is known as holographic duality, or the ADS-CFT correspondence, and it shows that there are some worlds in which there is no inherent incompatibility between quantum physics and general relativity, even if ADS-CFT cannot literally be the right description of our own universe. Now, like I said before, we don't yet know if this holographic framework is how quantum gravity works in our world. Experiments will have to decide, and so far, experiments sensitive to quantum gravitational effects are just too difficult to pull off. However, the questions are still urgent, and, thanks to holographic duality, physicists have made a lot of progress building models and understanding general features of quantum gravity that are plausibly common to many theories. Moreover, although we won't go into it in this video, these questions about quantum gravity turn out to have many remarkable connections to other parts of physics. So what is this theory? Holographic duality refers to an equivalence between two seemingly different physical systems. One of these systems, the boundary, is a more or less conventional quantum system with no explicit gravitational interactions. The other, the bulk, has explicit gravitational physics. These two systems look completely different at first glance, yet the duality claims they are equivalent. The duality is holographic because the bulk is a higher dimensional theory which is encoded like a hologram in its lower dimensional boundary. Why is holographic duality so powerful? Well, by understanding how the duality works, the so-called holographic dictionary that translates between the two sides, we come to understand how space-time itself can be viewed as emerging from quantum phenomena. Moreover, because we fully understand at least the ground rules on the boundary side, we can use the duality to make highly non-trivial predictions about quantum gravity physics on the bulk side. Our goal today is to learn the basics of both sides of the duality and get a glimpse of how gravity emerges from quantum. To do that, we first need to unpack some of the terms. ADS-CFT is short for the anti sitter space conformal field theory correspondence. The two pieces of the ADS-CFT moniker refer to the two sides of the duality. The CFT, or conformal field theory, is a specific kind of quantum field theory. The CFT is the boundary theory, and there is no gravity in the boundary. ADS, or anti de Sitter space, is a specific solution to Einstein's equations of general relativity with a negative cosmological constant. ADS refers to the bulk theory, and there is gravity in the bulk. Let's start with the CFT. There are actually many versions of holographic duality corresponding to many different choices of the CFT. We'll focus on a simple version in which the CFT is two-dimensional. This means it lives in one space dimension and one time dimension, so the combined space-time dimension is two. We can visualize space in the CFT as a circle. Let's choose the size of the circle so that the circumference is two pi. There is also a time coordinate which extends into the past and future. You can think of copies of the space existing at each moment of time. The CFT is defined on this cylindrical space-time and has degrees of freedom spread throughout this boundary space-time. These degrees of freedom are fields which vary in space and time. If we unwrap the circle for a moment, we can plot some possible field configurations versus space and then watch how they change with time. In quantum physics, the dynamics of these fields is encapsulated in a set of allowed energies and these are closer related to the frequencies at which the fields can wiggle. These dynamical rules can take many forms, corresponding to the many kinds of CFTs we could consider. However, there are some basic rules in common to all of them. One of these is that no signal can travel faster than the speed of light. For example, choosing the unit of time so that the speed of light is equal to 1, the time it takes a light pulse to cross from one side of the circle to the other is pi, and nothing can travel faster than this. We'll come back to this later. Now we turn to ADS. We can visualize the spatial part of ADS as a disk that fills in the circle in which the CFT lives. Including time, we get a solid cylinder that fills in the boundary cylinder. 
The ADS spacetime in our example lives in three spacetime dimensions, two from space and one from time. However, unlike the boundary spacetime, the bulk spacetime is curved. Let's see what this means. Consider the bulk geometry at a fixed moment in time. This is slightly subtle because, in general relativity, we can have many valid notions of time. But this can be safely brushed under the rug for now. The bulk geometry at fixed time, then, is like a disk. But this disk has a warped geometry. It's an example of a hyperbolic space, and it has a bunch of interesting properties. For example, in this visualization, each of those blue triangular shapes actually has the same size. One crucial fact is that, although it looks like it has a boundary, this boundary is actually infinitely far away. We can pick a point and lay down a coordinate system. Then if we start moving radially away from that point, the distance will keep increasing, but we never actually make it to the boundary. Indeed, every point in the hyperbolic disk is equivalent to every other, so the ADS spacetime has a high degree of uniformity and symmetry. The temporal part of the geometry is also warped, but more on that later. We also need to introduce the idea of a cutoff. To regulate the infinite distances that are possible in hyperbolic space, we pick a point which will become the center of the space and draw a circle of very large radius centered on that point. This circle becomes our cutoff surface, and by removing the part of the bulk outside the circle, we attain a finite patch of hyperbolic space. With these ingredients in hand, we can now state our first entry in the ADS CFT dictionary. The ground state of the CFT is dual to empty ADS space. Let's unpack this. Like any system, the CFT can be in different states or configurations. Among all these states, there is one with the lowest possible energy. This is called the ground state or the vacuum. The bulk theory can also be in different states, and simplifying somewhat, such bulk states correspond to different choices of the bulk geometry. The simplest choice is empty ADS space. So the connection is hopefully intuitive, but what is the evidence for this entry in the dictionary? It almost had to work this way, if it was going to work at all, since the states on both sides are states of lowest energy. But there are other checks as well. A very important one has to do with symmetry. The vacuum of the CFT has a large amount of symmetry. You can translate the system, or rotate it in space-time, or even rescale the system, and the ground state remains invariant. Invariance under those first two transformations is a property of most vacuum states in quantum field theory. But the latter, the rescaling or coarse graining symmetry, is a special feature of the CFT. It is part of what makes it a conformal field theory. In fact, there are even more symmetries in the full conformal group that characterizes the symmetry of the CFT, but we'll keep it simple for now. We can translate various CFT transformations into bulk ADS transformations. Moving along the boundary translates into a rotation in the bulk, and coarse graining on the boundary corresponds to moving radially in the bulk. We thus find that the symmetries match, with the ADS space effectively geometrizing the symmetries of the CFT. Another important check has to do with causality. We said earlier that the speed limit imposed by light was an inviolable element of the CFT. But when we draw the bulk as a disk, it suggests that we could take a shortcut through the bulk. Indeed, if the geometry in the bulk were like that of the boundary, then it seems that light could go from one side to the other via the bulk in a time of two faster than the time of pi via the boundary. But we know this is too fast. After all, we've already seen that the space in the bulk is curved, and the boundary is actually infinitely far away. So maybe light takes forever to go through the middle. Well, it turns out that time is warped in the bulk as well, so it is possible for a light pulse to go through the bulk from one part of the boundary to the other. And how long does this take? If we send the light pulse as fast as possible, it takes time of exactly pi. So again, we see a remarkable consistency between the boundary and bulk properties. Even the cutoff surface we introduced before plays an important role. Remember, we introduced this cutoff to regulate the infinite distances in hyperbolic space. Well, from the CFT point of view, there are seemingly different infinities related to very short distance fluctuations in the vacuum. Remarkably, these divergences are connected via ADS-CFT, and the cutoff deals with both of them. This is connected to what we saw with coarse graining. The radial direction in the bulk is related to the link scale in the boundary. This is all pretty cool, but it's just the tip of the iceberg. The CFT has all kinds of other states corresponding to adding excitations to the vacuum. Do these states have a bulk description? Well, according to the duality, yes, they must. 
although it doesn't guarantee that they have a nice geometrical interpretation. But many of them do. For example, what happens if we heat the CFT up and consider its thermodynamic properties? What is the bulk dual of such a thermal state in the CFT? If the temperature we set is high enough, then it turns out the bulk description is given by a black hole. So we would say that the thermal state of the CFT is dual to a bulk state in which the geometry is that of a black hole in ADS. This geometry looks like the ADS space-time out near the boundary, but it is strongly modified deep inside. The second entry highlights a key feature of holographic duality. While the vacuum of the CFT is dual to empty ADS, other states of the CFT are in general dual to a big class of space-times which are all ADS-like as you approach the boundary. The technical statement is that these space-times are asymptotically ADS. Now, black holes are famously thermal objects, so this connection again makes a lot of intuitive sense, but we can ask for more detailed checks. One such check is provided by the entropy of the black hole. General arguments going back to Bekenstein and Hawking show that a black hole has a thermal entropy, and that this entropy is proportional to its horizon area in Planck units. What is the CFT dual of this? Nothing but the thermodynamic entropy of the CFT. Notice in particular how the dimensions work. The black hole's entropy is, unusually, proportional to its surface area rather than its volume. But because the CFT lives in one less dimension than the bulk space-time, surface area in the bulk has the same dimensions as a volume in the boundary. So we recover the usual extensive behavior of thermal entropy in a quantum field theory. What sets how big the black hole is? The radius of the black hole is proportional to its temperature. If we increase the temperature enough, the black hole can reach all the way out to the cutoff surface. In essence, the black hole has consumed the entire space. From the CFT perspective, this happens when the temperature, suitably translated into a link scale, approaches the corresponding short distance cutoff in the CFT. Roughly speaking, there are no degrees of freedom left to thermalize. This is one of the ways we understand the dual role of the cutoff in ADS CFT. We have now learned two entries in the holographic dictionary that ground states in the CFT map to empty space in the bulk and that thermal states in the CFT map to black holes in the bulk. Let's return now to the question of the physical meaning of the bulk geometry. To understand this, we first need to introduce the idea of quantum entanglement. Going back to the CFT, we can have different field configurations, and the vacuum state actually contains many such distinct field configurations. We're not going to delve much into the important idea of quantum superposition here, but suffice it to say that these different field configurations can lead to a phenomenon of quantum entanglement. To start, we can visualize entanglement as a pair of points that are connected somehow. In the CFT, this might represent correlated field configurations at different points in space. Due to the scale invariance of the CFT, there are all different kinds of quantum entanglement present in its vacuum, from very short-ranged entanglement to much longer-ranged entanglement. An important general question we can ask in quantum theory is how much entanglement is present. We can answer this using a quantity called entanglement entropy. To define this quantity, we need to choose a subset of the CFT space. Then, roughly speaking, the entanglement entropy just counts how many of those entangled pairs have one side in the chosen subset and one side out. Pairs that are both in or both out don't count. Now we can come back to the holographic dictionary. What is the bulk dual of the boundary entanglement entropy? The answer is provided by the Ryu Takinagi formula which says that the boundary entanglement entropy is equal to the area in Planck units of a bulk minimal surface. Note that we say surface and area, but in the present case it'll be a curve in its length. Physicists just like to refer to these collectively as surfaces when the dimension is one less than the dimension of the bulk space. Let's unpack this RT formula. Start with the chosen CFT region. Now consider all the bulk curves that start and end on the endpoints of the chosen boundary region. Among all those, we find the curve with the minimal length. The entanglement entropy of the chosen CFT region is then equal to the length of this minimal curve in Planck units. There is one subtlety known as the homology constraint, but let's put that aside for now. Okay, so what does this give for the vacuum? Well, first, the minimal curve turns out to be a part of a circle. And second, the length of this curve is infinite. Remember, we said earlier that the boundary is infinitely far away. This is that same fact again. And this is physical because the CFT also has infinite entanglement arising from arbitrarily short distance field fluctuations. 
That is, unless we impose a cutoff. With the cutoff, we get a finite total amount of CFT entanglement, and the corresponding bulk minimal curve length is finite as well. The value predicted by the RT formula with this cutoff is rather remarkable, being proportional to the logarithm of the sine of the boundary angle. Remarkably, exactly the same answer can be derived from purely CFT methods. And so once again, we have a perfect match between boundary and bulk. The lesson seems to be that the bulk space-time is, in a precise sense, a direct manifestation of quantum entanglement. A slogan I like is that entanglement is the fabric of space-time. And this slogan isn't just hand-waving. We can actually modify the entanglement in the CFT and observe the bulk geometry changing in a corresponding way. For example, one could remove the most long-ranged entanglement in the CFT, and the resulting bulk geometry is modified in a corresponding fashion deep inside. One way to see this is to take the black hole space-time and apply the RT formula to the entire boundary. The RT surface becomes the event horizon, and we recover the formula for black hole entropy. If we did the same thing in empty ADS, the RT surface would shrink to zero consistent with the bulk having no entropy. We've seen a lot now, so let's step back and take stock. We learned that the ADS-CFT correspondence is a conjectured equivalence between two seemingly different systems a boundary quantum system, the CFT, which doesn't have gravity, and a bulk quantum gravity system, the asymptotically ADS space-time, which does have gravity. States in the boundary map to states in the bulk, and these bulk states often take the form of specific smooth geometries. And we've seen a glimpse of the enormous body of evidence that this is a mathematically consistent theory. What then have we learned about quantum gravity? ADS-CFT suggests that for each sensible theory of quantum gravity in asymptotically ADS space, there is a dual quantum system which can serve as a complete definition of the quantum gravity theory. In particular, that dual system obeys all the usual rules of quantum physics. And from this, we learn many amazing things. For example, that space-time is in a sense built from entanglement, and that black hole entropy can be precisely related to quantum state counting. We also learn that black hole evaporation should be a unitary process, at least in ADS-CFT. To be fair, this requires a bit more setup to formulate properly, but the rough argument is that evaporation maps to some CFT process, and these processes are guaranteed to be unitary. Of course, this doesn't explain how unitarity is manifested in the bulk, so there is still much to understand. Where can we go from here? One direction is to continue to unravel the connections between entanglement and geometry. For example, we can see how wiggles in entanglement translate to wiggles in space-time. Another direction is to delve more into the mysteries of black holes. Still another exciting direction is to explore how ADS-CFT relates to other frontier questions in quantum matter and quantum information science. Finally, since all available evidence indicates that our own universe is not asymptotically ADS, it is very interesting to try to extend holography beyond the confines of ADS-CFT to more realistic universes. But that's all for today. Take care, and see you next time.